to the presentation. Okay, over the next 20 to 30 minutes, we'll be talking about um, processing crab and lobster, uh, why that matters, uh, the introduce you to the deep chill process. We'll also look into some of the research data that we have, and then we will uh, look at how this deep chill process will impact your operation, your product, and more importantly, the business bottom line. All right, so um, both crab and lobster, very high value proteins, uh, typically distributed uh, frozen. Uh, there are good reasons for that. Number one, it has very short season um, to catch them and distribute them live, usually just a few weeks or a few months, so not that much time. Uh, it's not year round. It's expensive to ship them and keep them alive. Um, and also there is the dead loss potentials. On the other hand, when we deal with frozen, pro frozen product, it's shelf stable, it's less costly to ship them and also store them at the point of distribution. And it allows some flexibility for the processors in terms of planning the supply and demand for the year. They can also plan for the type of product, whether it's whole cooked, whether it's sections or uh, picked meat. Uh, it allows them to plan for that. So uh, you might be asking why we picked this topic of drip losses and how you can cut them. Um, what we've noticed, what we learned through years of working with uh, companies uh, who deal with uh, cooked crab and lobsters is that the drip loss is basically a hidden loss of money. Most people don't even know that they're losing that money. Um, it's something that many companies, they don't measure the drip losses uh, exactly. And uh, that's why we wanted to discuss that today and um, show you probably a better way of dealing with your product that allows you to improve the operation, but at the same time, save a lot of money. And that's what we're going to do today. Um, so I mentioned deep chill a couple of times. So for those of you who don't know what it is and you're asking what is deep chill then, it's a versatile cooling and preservation solution. So deep chill is all natural, composed of millions and millions of microscopic crystals, tiny little crystals that are suspended in brine solution. And depending on the percentage of uh, crystals to water in the solution, you are going to see a different form of deep chill. As you can see in these pictures, we have deep chill 10 to 40, which means there's 10 to 40 percent crystals in water. And therefore, it's a more liquid form. It pumps as easy as water. So it's very easy to work with in operations, but it cools better than ice. And we're going to see why and how. Um, in the middle, you have deep chill 40 to 70, which means it has between 40 to 70 percent uh, ice fraction. Uh, that gives it this thick ice cream like um, form. And on the right side, you see a 100 percent uh, deep chill, which is just pure crystals, just looking like snow. And just to show you how it actually flows, this is the slurry or uh, more liquid form. This is the C30, what you see in the uh, video. And here you see the paste form, which has, uh, which is a lot thicker than uh, the, um, the first version. And the last one is just like snow. So depending on your type of operation, depending on the application, and depending on the apparatus that you'll be using, we design a uh, we design the right uh, deep chill for you. Um, and here I want to use an analogy how deep chill differentiates from water or chilled water. So. When you try drinking a glass of very, very cold water, just super cold water, 
it's still easy to drink it. it you can still like, get it down but imagine if you want to do the same thing with a glass of margarita you immediately get a uh, brain freeze right so it's it's the same e effect even though the temperature difference is not that much just a, maybe a few uh, degrees colder in margarita um it just has all that cooling power right so same thing what you see here this is the heat transfer coefficient uh for comparing from chilled brine to deep chill 10 percent and deep chill 25 percent and what you see here the the heat transfer coefficient it directly correlates with just to say cooling power or how much faster and um, or how much energy for cooling it can transfer to the product. So if you look deep chill 25%, it's almost five times, uh, it has almost five times higher uh, power to cool the product. So um, over the next 15, 20 minutes or so, Kyle is gonna tell you how this deep chill then can be applied in your operation, what's the impact on the process and how it will um, impact the, the yield of the product. Okay, I can take it in. Thanks, Mina. And you know, I always just love pausing on this slide for a second, uh, just so that people realize that if you're comparing a liter of chilled water in a chiller to a liter of deep chill, deep chill is gonna have five, six, seven times more latent power, latent energy in that liter, which is surprise why we cool a heck of a lot faster than water. So in terms of the process, what we're not here to do is completely change the way that you operate your business. Rather, what we do is integrate into your existing operations without reinventing the wheel. So the crab and lobster are cooked, whether that's steam or boiled or continuous or batch, doesn't matter. We can integrate with any of those options. But instead of it going into an ambient tank or a chilled tank, it goes into a chilled tank on steroids, which would be deep chill. So we dramatically uh, lower that temperature from 80 or 90 degrees Celsius down to zero degrees Celsius. And at that point, you're either a processor who is extracting the meat, so you're picking the meat from the sections or whole cooks, or those sections or whole cooks are going to be brine frozen. And the brine freezing is one area where we have a very innovative solution. So Brine chillers in every processor that I've ever been into have been an issue in terms of operations. If the salinity starts to drop down to 85% saturation, even the coil begins to freeze up and you begin to run into operational problems, which has an impact on your through. Rather than that, we utilize deep chill in that exact same tank rather than use your ammonia coil and we're able to uh, push through multiples of the, of the same mass through the same, uh, con the same tank or the same container. And after which it would just go to packing or distribution or glazed and go into cold storage. So again, we're not changing the process, we're integrating with the process. And again, just in terms of advantages, rapid chilling, we're going to show you some test results in a few minutes that are really going to blow your mind in terms of how fast we can cool. And we all know this, the faster you cool is the less weight you lose. All of or a vast majority of that weight loss is going to happen when it goes from the cooker to the chiller and the time it takes to bring that temperature down. And also, because deep chill is so cold and because those uh, microscopic ice particles act like a battery, when the cooked product hits deep chill, it instantly stops cooking or almost instantly stops cooking just because of the high heat coefficient. And we've done some really good testing or some testing has been done for us by the Marine Institute showing snow crab tests. And we wanted this to be an apples to apples comparison we know how much more energy deep chill has compared to water. So we've seen operators uh, put crushed ice or flake ice into salty water to really try and drive down those temperatures quickly. So in one test, we had 44 pounds of ice and water. So that's 22 pounds of ice 
with water and salt at a 6.2% salinity constantly agitated. We didn't just leave it in the water. And we compared that to a 23% deep chill solution. So that's 23% to 50 pounds. So that's only 11 and a half pounds of ice. So right away, we're using about half of the ice as the first test. And in the second formulation, we see that it's 27%, which would be 13 and a half pounds of ice. So in both of our formulations, we're using considerably less ice with uh, agitation and then idling. So we're not agitating it as much. We're using less ice. And Mina, let's see what the results look like. Dramatic. So deep chill is in gray and blue. And in terms of the time it took to go from somewhere between 85 and 95 degrees Celsius and zero, four to six minutes, which was actually a fraction of the cook time. Whereas the flake ice, water and salt formulation, even at 10 minutes or, or 14 minutes was barely below 10 degrees Celsius. And if this line uh, were extended considerably, you would eventually see the product get close to zero degrees Celsius without actually going below it. Now, this has a big impact in terms of drip loss, because if you remember, the faster you cool is the less weight you lose. And in lab tests, there was a 6% delta between deep chill and flake ice and water. And these test results are dramatic, and these are whole cups. So sections um, get even more dramatic results just because of the higher drip loss that is inherent in sections. But with whole cooks, we found that uh, companies don't necessarily uh, document the drip loss in the same way. So this, this was really designed to show you how much better a deep chill, chill solution is than chilled brine. Some other testing we've done was with Dungeness crab for an internal customer. And these results are even more dramatic than the ones we just presented. So we took Dungeness crab, we didn't want to skew the results. We put our thermistor in the thickest part of the crab, which is the shoulder. So we can see the whole cook on the left with two probes, one in each shoulder, as well as a control, and some sections over here with the thermistors or thermal probes inside the thickest part of the meat. And in terms of cooling time, Many times we think about cooling as the limiting factor in your production. You know, like it takes 10 minutes to, uh, to cook the sections, and then it takes 10 minutes to chill, and then another 10 minutes to freeze or something along those lines. What we've done instead is we've reversed things around where now the cooker is the limiting factor in your production. In this test, it took us something like 12 minutes or 10 minutes to heat up from 10 degrees Celsius to 94 degrees Celsius, but only six minutes to go from 94 to zero. And what's even more interesting about these section tests is the, deep, is the inertia that's already in the product. So again, if you remember, we put our, our probes in the center of mass. So we're, we're documenting the internal temperature here, but because deep chill has super cooled the exterior of the crab in this case, we see the inertia taking effect and it, re it reaching an equilibrium with the internal part of the mass. And this black line is the control. It's the temperature of the medium, in this case, deep chill. And the blue line is the temperature of the probe. We see the temperature continuing to fall, even though the crab was taken out at zero degrees Celsius, it fell down to negative 3.5. Here's another test we've done with butchered crab. And instead of doing it as a dual tank system where you have a chill tank and then a brine, brine freeze tank, we thought to ourselves, uh, we can really speed up this process by only having one tank in the operation. So it goes from the cooker directly into the brine chiller. And it took nine minutes to go from about five degrees Celsius to 90 degrees Celsius but only six minutes to crash that temperature to zero. And then another six minutes to bring it down to negative 11 degrees Celsius. So if you were looking for a way of really optimizing your, opti your, your operation, 
going from two or three tanks down to one uh, is definitely an option that we can support. And again, with cryo deep chill, uh, this is the whole crab. So instead of sections, and you know, we're never going to beat the time that we just had in those sections. But the the full cooks are just as dramatic uh, in terms of reference points. So it took us 19 minutes to heat the crab from four degrees to 84 degrees, so an 80 degree delta, but only 13 minutes to drop even more than that to zero degrees Celsius and another eight minutes to bring it down to negative seven, which would be frozen right before the glazing and cold storage phase. And what's even, I mean, if you could just go back one. So one big difference between us and RSW systems or us and brine freezers or, or, or chill tanks is you'll notice that when you put mass, like if you have a batch operation where you're putting 300 pound trees into your brine chiller, you notice that the temperature goes up in that brine chiller and then the chiller works like mad to try and drive that temperature down. Whereas deep chill is a little opposite. So we can see as when the deep chill went into the, uh, went into the medium, the temperature didn't go up. It maintained and continued going down. It went from negative 16 Celsius down to negative 20 degrees Celsius. So we don't have the same problems or the same challenges as the current brine system. And we like to talk about success stories here and just things or places that we've really made a difference. And for one Canadian lobster processor in New Brunswick, they had a real challenge. They were cooling or they were processing 55,000 pounds a day of lobster. And this was a continuous process and their chiller just couldn't keep up. It took them 20 minutes to bring it down to 10 degrees Celsius. And then they used another tank to bring it down to two degrees Celsius. And this really limited their processing capacity and it all came down to limiting factors. So the real limiting factor in their production was this chiller tank. And another problem that it has was it chewed through electricity. So some of the things we were able to do is number one, faster cooling. We were able to cool, I mean, 50% faster. Now it took us 12 minutes to drive it down to two degrees Celsius and eliminate that additional tank. The customer noticed yield increases. And again, this makes sense because the faster you cool is the less weight you lose. And more importantly, they are now able to, use, to have additional throughput using their existing equipment and infrastructure. And just to go back to one of the first things that we were saying, we're not here to reinvent the wheel. We're not here to completely redefine your operation. We're looking to integrate with the equipment and, and, and process that you currently have to make it better. And we also are able to, in some cases, to lower electricity usage just because of how efficient our systems are. And in terms of operational advantages, I think we were just touching on some of this. So we're able to reuse that existing infrastructure and put more mass through the same footprint. But if you were redesigning your facility and are trying to maybe install an additional pick line and need that facility footprint, we can work with you on creating smaller tanks to push through more mass than you're currently processing. And also in terms of hygiene, you don't need to use a recirculation system with ours. We have models out there where there's no circulation. And in terms of flexibility, we're able to support both continuous and batch processes. We're able to support two and one and three tank designs. We really integrate our systems to your process. And you know, one of the last things that I like to talk about is why you would do this in the first place. There needs to be a return. So what is our impact on the bottom line? And it all comes down to yield. So the higher the yield is the faster the ROI. We could include other things like these nebulous operational savings or electricity usage or water usage or whatever the case may be. But at the end of the day, the main return for you will come from increasing yield. In terms of budget figures, we use 1% yield gain as of, of the meat as our budgetary figure. Again, some lab testing showed 
uh, five or six times that figure, but we're, we're trying to be as realistic as we can here. And obviously that will depend on your operations. If you're using an ambient tank, that's one of the places where you'll really notice yield needs. But let's pretend that you're a processor doing 2 million pounds per season of lobster. Now you're not cooking the tails because they're sold raw or sold brine frozen. So really we're just talking about the claws and the body. And that's uh, just south of 60% of the weight, you know, about 33% for the claw, um, about 25% in the body. So that's 1.16 million pounds. And let's pretend that the value of that cooked product is $20 a pound. And if we are making the promise here of a 1% yield gain, then really we're talking about an additional 11,600 pounds added to uh, your top line, which is a value of $232,000. So for every point, that we can win back through yield gains. That's an additional $232,000 that goes directly to the bottom line. There's no additional product cost because we're using the exact same weight you're currently pushing today. All we're doing is helping you uh, realize more gain, more yield from the same weight. And that's where the value of our systems really come. And that's pretty much all I have. Um, here is our contact information. Uh, my name is Kyle Morrison, so that's kmorrison at deepchill.com and uh, Mina Borhani at deepchill.com, so mborhani at deepchill.com. We're always available at this phone number. And uh, now is the time for your question. All right, thank you so much, Kyle. It's Always a good sign when you have the same number of participants in the beginning and in the end. So it looks like nobody dropped out. That's always a good sign. Um, uh, so again, you can type in your questions here uh, in the Q&A box. Um, please do so, don't be shy. <laughs> Maybe I can ask a, a question from Mark about the system and oh, you I have to to here. you have to do something, <laughs> right? Um, tell us about the uh, salinity used in our system and why you would require uh, salt in the process or how much of it you would need. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mina. Thanks uh, for inviting me uh, on the panel. Um, so some of the questions that we do get is, you know, must the system use salt? Is salt a required consumable? Um, so th the magic of the system really plays on chemistry between um, a temperature depressant um, solute in a, in a solvent. So typically it can be uh, salt and water, it can be many different things. All types of salt do it. Uh, you can even have alcohol. Uh, we'll, we'll have the same chemistry, ethylene glycol, propylene glycol. Uh, and in fact, the different applications that we have use different fluids, uh, depending on really it is about the temperature that you want. Um, and so the system does require salt to run, uh, mostly because that's how you can encourage the formation of the ice crystals out of the brine, the pure ice crystals uh, with the chemistry that's there. Uh, exactly the concentration of salt that you want actually um, depends on what temperature you want the deep chill at. So, for example, just like your brine freezer, if you're looking for a, we calling it a, a, a cryo deep chill, I think cryo is technically minus 70, but uh, this stuff is so cold when you put your, your hand in it, your fingers, your skin freezes up, so we call it cryo. Maybe it's a bit cheeky, uh, but anyway, if you want to go down to those temperatures, say minus 18, minus 20, uh, you would be pretty close to saturated uh, levels of salt, so you're talking about 20%, 18, 20% uh, salt content, so in 100 kilograms of water, you'd be putting uh, 20 kilograms of salt, right? Um, if you're looking just to chill uh, and not freeze, uh, then we're, we're talking about maybe uh, three to 5% salinity. Um, a follow-up question on this also is, is there any salt uptake uh, into the product? Um, and believe, uh, so in the chill tanks, uh, the, the saltiness is actually very similar to what an RSW system would be or what the sea, uh, say seawater would be. And so there's not really additional salt uptake uh, into the product. 
Um, it, it's it's you know the, the critters live in the ocean. It's the same type of saltiness that they that they uh, are, uh, they survive in. Um, and then uh, so so there's barely barely much salt uptake um, if we use say a three percent. However, that we do have some customers that actually are looking to uh, they're looking for salt uptake in terms of the flavor profile and the quality of the product. And they, their particular markets they sell into um, uh, have a, a higher salt tolerance or salt aptitude. And in that case, we could even lower the temperature a bit further. In other words, make it a little bit saltier, so 5%, 6%. And then you would actually encourage salt uptake. Um, Then what about the the cryo deep chill? So that's very salty, right? That's about as salty as you can get water. Interestingly enough, what happens there is you take the product out of uh, the chill tank. Uh, You might, in your process, you might want to do a glazing step. In other words, um, you know, the, the deep chill, I'm sorry, sorry, the, the, the product comes out at minus three, you would put it under a, um, a waterfall of water, this would be fresh water, uh, to create that glazing. And when you put that back in the, the very cold cryo deep chill tank, it's so cold that that water layer freezes almost instantly, it creates like a really nice glassy cover. Um, and once it's frozen solid, then uh, salt no longer uh, penetrates or migrates into the, the product. So there's actually no no salt uptake in the, the cryo. All right, thank you. Uh, so something about meat separation, if it changes with deep chill, and if so, how? Maybe Kyle, you can take on that? Yeah, so I've actually spoken to a number of processors about this as well and the when you cold shock that crab or lobster uh, what happens is it separates it from the shell so you're able to pull out much larger pieces of meat so that's one of the operational savings that we get into because the pickers can pick more meat in the same time um, and the chunks of meat themselves or the pieces of meat themselves are larger and more intact but it's just an interesting thing about the temperature differential and it, and it all comes from crashing that temperature right away and sucking the heat out so quickly. All right. Uh, okay, one last thing is what makes lobster chill faster in deep chill compared to chill water? Hey, Kyle, you wanna? Yeah, yeah so... I, let, let, me, let me talk to that one, Kyle, because yeah, I think, sure. I think you, yeah, we, we already covered it right in the beginning, right? So we spoke about things like heat transfer coefficients and stuff like that, but. I have a bunch of people say to me, well, I could just crush ice and mix it in seawater and then I have deep chill, do I not? Um, and the question is, you know, why is, say, a crushed ice or brine system, why does deep chill cool so much quicker, specifically quicker, right? Yeah. Um, and it has to do with the fact that uh, the, the thermal transfer is through a phase change, a physical um, uh, operation that is a phase change. So the exact same way when, you're, when you have sweaty or you get wet, and the water evaporates off of your skin and you can feel your skin cooling down way quicker than if you just blew air over it. Really what's happening here is the product is in contact uh, with these microscopic uh, uh, ice particles that are so small that they they can have excellent coverage over the surface area of what it's cooling. And actually what's happening is those ice crystals are melting. And so they're drawing huge amounts of energy very quickly through this phase change. It's actually a latent heat step rather than a sensible heat step. Sorry, I'm, I have to prove that I'm head of engineering, so I've got to throw out these terms. So, so for example, you might stick um, uh, a product in brine, and what's happening there is the brine is heating up while the product is cooling down. When you put it in deep chill, the deep chill isn't, in fact, heating up. It's all the little ice crystals are melting. So they're busy melting away, which pulls the heat out. Uh, there might be some boundary layer uh, you know, where, where uh, you don't have uh, any ice crystals there, but part of what we do is make sure that there's good agitation in, the, in these chilling tanks or freezing tanks. Uh, and and really, that's the reason why it, it happens so much quicker. Um, and in terms of energy density, so we talk about thermal storage. Um, what happens here is you just like if you want to keep your drink cold, you put in an ice cube. If you want to keep it cold throughout, you know, we're watching the Soccer World Cup throughout the whole game, you might put five ice cubes in. So you're basically adding thermal storage in there. So with deep chill, what you can do is you can just make make it thicker, you can add more, uh, generate a thicker fraction, basically means there's more ice crystals in your uh, in your slurry or in, in your deep chill uh, fluid. Uh, and what that means is, is not that it would cool it necessarily quicker, but you can cool more stuff in there, right? You could put um, multiple baskets in your chill tank if you have a thicker fraction. 
So just some different ideas around uh, why does it cool quick versus why does it cool so much? Very interesting. I think okay. so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we all work at DeepChill, so we find it interesting anyway. <laughs> Uh, all right, if there are no other questions, I'll, leave, uh, I'll wait for a few more seconds just in case another question comes in. But um, once again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thanks, Kyle. Thanks, Mark.